to introduce our very special guest, Armando Lopez Correa. Uh, he is a Cuban writer, journalist, and editor who resides in New York. His first novel, The German Girl, is an international bestseller that has been translated in 16 languages and published in more than 30 countries. His second novel, The Daughter's Tale, was published in 2019. The Night Travelers was published just this year in January. He is also the author of the memoir In Search of Emma, Two Fathers, One Daughter, and the Dream, and the Dream of a Family. For the Night Travelers, but I have received the Creative Writing Award of the Sintas Foundation, Foundation, Foundation Fellowship in 2022. He is a recipient of various outstanding achievement awards from the National Association of Hispanic Publications and the Society of Professional Journalists. He was recognized by AT&T and the Humanity of Connection Award and as the Journalist of the Year by Hispanic Public Relations Association of New York. In Cuba, he entered the world of print journalism in 1988 when he was appointed to appointed the editor of Tabalas, a national theater and dance magazine based out of Havana. His career as an American journalist started in 1991 in El Nuevo Herald, the Miami Herald Spanish edition newspaper. He moved to New York in 1997 to work as a senior writer at People and Espanol magazine and was the brand editor in chief since 2007 until 2022. He is a graduate of the University of Arts in Cuba and has a postgraduate degree in journalism from the University of Havana. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Armando Lucas Cleo. So much for being here. I'm being in front of the library. I'm in front of the library. <laughs> and even, you know, I, I, I am in front of the New York Public Library, and even I have an office. And this is a, you know, a correct from author who has a contract with the publishing house. And I have a beautiful office in the main building for the second Yes, we cannot promise an office. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you can say I'm in front of the library. <laughs> Um, please tell us about yourself and a little bit about your, about your background. Yeah, uh, uh, if you read my books, you are going to know that I am a journalist. There's a lot of research in my books. Even for the last 12 pages, I think it's the bibliography, and it's over, I don't know, 200 books that I research yeah, doing this. And you're going to see the journalists at the same time, my background as a the theater critic. Uh, I think I construct all my story in an atmospheric way, as one of the critics of the New York Times I remember saying. It was a great review for the, the Doris Dell. But he said, Correa has an atmospheric style. So, oh my God, this is positive or negative? <laughs> and, and you can see that's my, my background as, uh, as, a, as an author. I'm a journalist, I spent 25 of my life working for people in Spanish, you know, people magazine, Hispanic edition. And I have three kids. I have Emma is going to college this September. <laughs> and I have twins, Anna and Luke, and they are 13 and going to high school. That's it. A lot of your first steps right yeah. there for them. Um, so as you mentioned, your writing career began as a journalist. Mm -hmm. What made you want to become a writer and yeah. write uh, an author and write yeah. novels? And how was the transition from journalism to becoming an author? Uh, I always say that I'm a reader who writes. And my first obsession uh, it was the you know the tragedy of the MSS St. Louis with all these Jewish refugees uh, trying to find a place in 1939 and they left Hamburg, Germany. Uh, 937 uh, Jewish refugees with the permit of disembark in Havana. And when they arrived in Havana, they denied, you know, the president at that moment denied the entrance. They stayed for a week and tried to find refugees in United States and Canada, uh, and they received another negative response from the government. And they went back to Europe, and they ended in, you know, in extermination camps, and because the war started in September. I was obsessed with that story, because when I was a child, I remember the 70s and 80s in Havana, my grandmother saying, I am not Jewish, by the way, I, that I know. 
And my grandmother said, Cuba is going to pay very dear dividends what they did to the U.S. refugee for the next 100 years. You know, my grandmother was a little crazy. And when I went to college, I have access to the National Archive, and I requested to have any documentation for the St. Louis that the library whispering to me, saying, we used to have like three boxes Lego with the St. Louis, and all of them disappeared during the 70s. And I moved to, to Miami in 1991, working on the head of half access, you know, to different kind of research. And I started buying books, uh, everything related to the St. Louis that was available. I had menus for the books, I had programs, pictures, or you know, postcards. And because I am a journalist, I was thinking to write a non-fiction book interviewing, you know, the survivors. A lot of children survived. But in 2005, I became a father. And then I, I, I always said that my daughter, Emma, gave voice to the German government. You know? uh, I think the beginning of the book is something like, I'm going to be 12, uh, 12 years old, and I decided to kill my parent. And at the beginning, it was nine years old, thank you, because Emma was growing up. I mean, we went to print, Emma had uh, 12 years old, and then everything changed. I, I decided that the best point of view for the book, it was the voice of my daughter. I am, at the same time, as a father, and I became a novelist. Oh, very nice. Um, as you mentioned before, you did a lot of research on the voyage of the St. Louis during World War II. And I know that the three novels, The German Girl, Daughter's Tale, as well as your new one, The Night Travelers, uh, it's a saga. And they all kind of have a relation to the St. Louis, the voyage of the St. Louis. Um, could you give a little bit more information on how that specific event in history ties in with your three novels? I think that, that St. Louis is a kind of lame of you. You know, of course, the German girl is based on the St. Louis, and one of the chapters is the whole travesty of the boat uh, and the survivors. You know, only 28 passengers disembarked in Havana. And, and the daughter still, I mentioned the St. Louis in one of the chapters. Uh, she sent one of her daughter uh, to the St. Louis, and you know, and she died later. But the night traveler, when this young poet, German young poet, uh, she has a, a, a Michelin. You know what is Michelin? Michelin is when it's like, it's like a mixed race, thing, you know. And it was like a pejorative term when Hitler created the racial law, the Nuremberg racial law, that you have to be pure to survive. If you are a machine, you have to be sterilized when you are seven years old. And I build the whole story around that. This mother, desperate to try to find a place to her daughter, because you know the sterilization, it was uh, through x rays and, and x rays. And, and for the boy, it was the vasectomy. When you are seven years old, you can kill you if I put a lot of x rays in your body. And then she found a Jewish family. They had permanent disembarked in Havana. It was very expensive. They paid for it. And she sent the daughter with the Jewish family. I built the whole story around that. But the, that's the idea for the night traveler. You know, St. Louis is only mentioned because she traveled to Cuba on that. And, and marketing department in San Juan should decide that they prefer to go the trilogy. But, they are independent book, completely independent, and maybe I'm going to write another fourth book. <laughs> and, but for me, they are different books. And I am very lucky because all my books, when Simon Schutzer decided to acquire the publishing house, it was only, you know, for the German girl, I, I think I only had, I presented only 10 pages. I have been writing this book for over 10 years, but I think I presented only 10 pages to them that I think they were ready to show. For the daughter still, it was a proposal. And for the night travel, it was a sentence. Mm -hmm. and, and then it took me like a four years to develop the story. And the sentence was around a young poet has a Michelin daughter, and she's seven, she became obsessed with the number seven, and she needs to try to find a place for the daughter. And then my mind started working and complicated the story a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think you will ever write a nonfiction 
book? I don't out? think so. No, I, 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 I think I'm a fiction writer. Yeah. And I love historical fiction. But you, as I say, uh, you're going to see that I'm a journalist. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, for example, for the German girl, if I say that May 17, it was raining during the book, it was raining. So I am very, very uh, picky with the data and the information. I'm respectful with the survivor. Uh, I have, right now, I, I, I held the office of the prime minister before the pandemic. You know, he has became really weird after the pandemic. The prime minister in Canada, I bring seven children for the same, you know, they are old people now, seven children for the same, doing when they did the, the, the apology in the House of Commons. And all the survivors that I have in Europe, I have like three girls, that I, they go with me to all the book presentation, I, I, you know, I dedicated the books to them. Nice. Um, I appreciate how much work that you do and how much research and interviewing survivors from these events. Uh, and I enjoy it. You know, for me, the process is better than the end. I love doing research and interview these people. I'm a keen friend of these people and going to their home and understand their family. And for example, the, one of the survivors, she lives in Toronto, in Canada. And when I went there to interview her, Right now, you know, I go to the Shabbat with her. I know her family in Canada, her family in Mexico, and her family in Israel, because uh, they went to Holland. It was a group from the St. Louis who ended in Holland, then to the Buchenwald camp, and they survived all this camp. And they ended in Mexico, you know. I go over the Mexican of the St. Louis, and she speaks Spanish perfectly. And, and when I went to interview her, she opened a, a black box, which, you know, and they have all this letter from the boat, the announcement from the boat in German. They have the wording of this embark, the letter that she received uh, from the government in Cuba. And, and they never, you know, she never talked to her children about the St. Louis. They keep it. And I said to them, you have to protect all these documents. We were crying when she, you know, she showed me everything, and we did a, a small documentary for, you know, Univision, and it was very emotional to see these people trying. You know, she became a star in Canada. She went with me for the whole tour. Even the prime minister invited and dedicated, you know, the apology that they did to her. It was beautiful. Yeah, and I think that that is so important to add into historical fiction writing because you need facts, but then it also really um, brings together the characters for the reader to create an emotional connection and feel the pain and the journey. And then even the good parts of some of these really tragic events that happened in the past. Um, do you feel that in your novels, the issues or themes that are in them have um, any kind of connection to today's world, or um, the events that you were talking about, or that are the stories of your novels, um, do you feel like in today's world there's a connection between those events and then what's going on today? Um, when I, you know, the, the first time that my, the German girl began, that said it was in Australia, and I did a huge tour in Australia. And I'm going now in May, in April 26, for 10 days. And I remember it was 2016, it was in the middle of this. You remember the Syrian refugees walking around in Europe, thousands of them. And they told me, I you wrote this story based on them? I said, no. If you see my book right now, I finished two years before. Because you know, I write it in Spanish, my translator is in London, I have to work it with the English version, with my editor. It took two years to finish the book, you know, before the Syrian crisis. And then another time, I think I want to present, when I finished the Night Traveler, it was the crisis with the border in US-Mexico and all these kids in cages, you remember. No? Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't write this book thinking about that. I finished my book before that time. But at, at the end, there is a connection with the reality. It's not something that I do consciously, 
but at the same time, I'm, I am a Cuban refugee. You know, I left my country in 1991. I, I, you know, I have to try to learn English here because to create my family, building a new career. I think I have everything. Even I, I explained that I, I, I am not connected to the Holocaust directly, more than my grandmother saying that crazy thing that you is going to pay for the dealer for the next 100 years. But all my books, you can see some kind of connection with today. I think so. I all, you know, I, I remember in Australia saying that talking to the readers, I realized that my book is about the fear that we have to the other one. You know, the people who has a different skin color, has a different accent, or have a different sexual orientation, or, or even a different God. I think all my books is about that kind of fear. And I'm including in this fear, you know. So, um, but, so you would say that you see some parallels between oh, yeah. yourself All growing time. up in yeah. Cuba under communism and the characters in your I, novels? During the, the crisis in the U.S. border, um, and Laura, you know, my friend here, my PR, helping me here in Florida, uh, we were discussing a lot about all this mother abandoning, you know, their children and sending by themselves to the U.S. You know, and sometimes losing them. And, and everybody was questioning these mothers, how can a mother can send their child by themselves? You know? And I always say, think about the kinder transport. If you know the kinder transport, it was in 1939, over 10,000 children, Jewish children, were sent by themselves to England. And they survived the war, you know, 90% of the foreign were killed in Auschwitz. You know, they saved the children. You can question that kind of foreign that they say they should. And in Cuba in 1962, uh, over 14,000 kids were sent with the help of the Catholic Church to the United States to save them from the Communist Party in Cuba. That was another reality. We always have to be, you know, for me, a kind of compassion when a mother or a father have to send their kid to save them for misery or for violence or for war, I think so. Yes, um, my mother grew up in Cuba as well and they left in the 60s and it was very similar where they all left in different times yeah. until years later eventually yeah. they were The family had always invited mm -hmm. when you live in a war in a different, then we, we had to be compassionate, I think. Um, I read an article in Time Magazine titled My Havana Homecoming. I know it was from several years ago, but um, it's about your first time visiting Cuba since you left. Um, what was that like for you, and have you been back since that article came out? Uh, because I am a journalist, I was not allowed to go back to Cuba. When I left in 1991, I uh, was young and had my whole family there, I had my books. And I remember that I get a visa, even I'm Cuban, I need a visa and a Cuban passport. I, I am an American citizen, but they require a Cuban passport. It's very expensive, by the way. And when I arrived in, in, uh, in Havana, the airport, they sent me back in the same plane. Yeah. I was, it, for me, it was traumatic. You know, my whole family waiting, waiting for me at the airport. Yeah. And then I decided, okay, I have to go to Cuba on the side, move on with my life, and living in New York, you know, you know about Cuba when there is a sentence maybe in the New York Times. But my, you know, I have my whole family even now in Miami, they send me everything information. Fidel Castro is alive, Fidel Castro died, you know, Cuba in Miami, you know, where they, they, they have Cuba to close to them. And I always think of myself like I am a bad Cuban because, uh, uh, you know, it's painful for me. And when Obama opened the diplomatic relationship, they created the first uh, delegation of editors and publishers, American editors and publishers, because I am the editor of people in Espanol, they included me, not because I'm, I was an author, because my book at that time, the German girl, it was in, in printing. And I said to them, okay, I'm a Cuban, even I am American, I needed her meat to this important in Havana, I need everything. And they gave me the permit. 
then when I arrived that, you know, I came back and I, I started the code saying, I am the worst of the human, you know, I am a free bad human. But then I explained my experience, seeing my father, seeing the home where I grew up, and coming back and having my children waiting for me, and I realized that Cuba is still in me. And that was the, the goal. Then the next year, I went with the same delegation of publishers and booksellers, and by the way, some people from the library. And we, with the president of Simon & Schuster, we bring 100 books to donate to the small Holocaust Museum that they have in Havana. And I decided to donate the direct, the captain of the St. Louis that I had, all the material, and when we arrived, they banned the book. They retained all the book in costume. And uh, when I, I explained to this girl, this woman from the synagogue that I was presented the book, that she fought for 10 years to have back the synagogue from her grandfather. And he said, it's Saturday, I'm leaving tomorrow, you're going to have a problem if we keep doing the presentation the next day. He said, no, we're going to do it. And the next day, she was pale. And she said, oh my god, I received a call from the, you know, the Communist Party. And they said that you need a religious visa to present in the synagogue. And I said, he's not a rabbi, he's an author. He's donating all these documents for us and the books. And then we presented in panic. And my mother testing me, please, and don't, don't be alone in Cuba, whatever. And I left and I decided that I have to put Cuba again on the side. And I think I'm never going to come back for now. Yeah, yeah. Um, you wrote a memoir, In Search of Emma, which is about how you became a father through surrogacy. And you mentioned earlier that Emma is the voice of the, of, yes, a German girl. Um, do you have any other characters that are inspired by people in your life or something similar to that? I write fiction, but all my fiction, even is from 1930s or the beginning of the century, they're always related with my life. All the houses in the German girl, you know, the house with Hannah Lee in Bedaro is my house in, in Cuba. And the apartment where the family is living in, in New York, you know, Anna and Ida, is my apartment in Morningside Park. And looking to the park, it's, it's, and I think it's, it's like a concept because all of the apartments in New York, they're my apartment. I need to change the other because of the people are going to think it's going to be the same character. But uh, even the ages of the, the, the characters in the German girl, you know, Louis is. It's like my mother, you know, Alma is my grandmother, say Cuba is going to pay very dearly for the next 100 years. All the characters, they are based in a way in, in my family. I think so. My, my son, Lucas, he said, when you're going to write a book when the character is a boy and he's going to be called Lucas, you know, because I have the, the book about Emma. Anna is one of the characters in the German girl, and we need Lucas. It's okay, Lucas. Then one of the books that I sold to Simon Schuster, and that is only a sentence, I have to write a book. And it's called The Island of Neverland, is based in a boy. You know. I like that. That's nice. Um, so your novels have these either oh, yeah. a duo timeline or like a multi timeline. How do you build the story connecting the two timelines? That's not, I am a kind of, you know, there are different kind of author. The kind of one is an architect that they prefer all the scene, the structure, and they start, you know, putting all the content in all this structure. I am a different kind of author. I am a gardening, you know, I put some ideas and trying to water the idea. And the, the idea is what it did. Now, I became an architect when I finished my first draft. When I finish my first draft, I decide if it's gonna be first person or third person, or it's gonna be two lines, different storyline, it's gonna be past and present, it's gonna be linear, you know, everything. Uh, uh, I, I, I am writing and think, seeing what is gonna happen, and sometimes the next day I think, oh my God, I don't know where I found this kind of solution for the character. 
and, and if you just three months later you're going to start beating your trap, you surprise yourself. Because I sometimes think I call this, and I, I always surprise for my mind when I feel the stories. And right now I'm writing about inspire my grandmother. The book is called What We Once Were, and it's the story of the whole 20th century. My mother, my grandmother is the daughter of a Spanish immigrant who arrived at the end of the 19th century, and she was born at the beginning of the 20th, and she died at the end of the 20th. And it's all the whole story of Cuba, the excitement in the fifties in New York. And right now it's like a, you know, it's very consecutive. But I don't know what happened when I finished the front. Um, what advice would you give to other writers, whether it be journalism or writing fiction? Yeah, I'm I'm reading all the time and my Brain, you know, I never have a blank page. And, oh my God, what I'm gonna write this time? I don't, I don't only need to have the mood, you know. I have to feel well. I, I can have a lot of stress when I'm writing. But the most important part for me that I, the only need is read around 45 minutes before I start writing. And my brain is like a muscle, you know. You feel it warm, and I always read in fiction and. And I, I always try to read books that is, for me, a, a surprise because of the theme and became a success. I love to understand that kind of formula or proposal. And when I read nonfiction, because I'm doing research, I am not a nonfiction reader per se. Yeah. Um. I, I dabble in both. Sometimes I love a good memoir every once in a while. Um, no, but, memoir, I love memoir too. Okay, but just like straight But I'm telling when I'm talking about some theme or concepts. Uh, I agree, I agree. Um, what's the best way for readers to stay up to date with your most current work? Uh, with my books, like that. Yeah, your books. You have a website or? Well, oh, yeah, I have a website. It's my whole name, and I have all the event, events that I want to have. I started today. I'm trying to post all the, you know, the say of poems that I write is connected to my social media. My social media is my name. And yeah. easy to find. <laughs> um, and my last question to you is well, I guess it's two questions. Um, what are you currently reading? And what book recommendation would you give for our audience today? Well, yeah, I'm reading right now an, uh, an Argentinian writer um, that her name sounds German, is Samantha Schwebling. And I am reading her because my agent, you know, is going to be presenting her. And she won the National Book Award recently with seven empty houses. And it's a beautiful book about mothers and daughters relationship. And I recommended the last book that I read. I think he's coming next month to do some books. Wonderful. I think every lawyer from here is gonna love it because it's is the same story for four point of view and it's written, you know, brilliant. I, I think it's a masterpiece. And it's gonna win the Pulitzer Prize. I think so. <laughs> Spanish is completely, it's, it's a very complicated language. And in English, you have a page. In Spanish, you have two pages to have an idea. And every time that I'm writing, I'm thinking, this is not what I'm working in English. I'm trying to write thinking how it's going to sound when they translate the idea. Even the names of the character, I'm trying to put name like Anna, that you know you can understand Anna. Because some kind of name, <clears throat> it could be complicated in English. And I write for this market, for Hispanic living here, for American living here, and 
and even, you know, it's a German girl sold already one million copies around the world. But for me, this is the country that I live. This is my country, and my, my audience is here. But when the other problem is the case story is Sediva, you know, my translator, in the translator of Isabel Allende, Perez Reverto, all the big names in the Hispanic world. And when I decided with my agent that he's going to be my translator, uh, he sent me, you know, they sent the first eight pages of the German girl to different translators. They sent it to me with only, you know, with a name, number one, number two, or number three. I said, Johanna, the only person who can translate the German girl, I said, number three. Johanna is my editor at that moment. I said, Armando, he's a diva. He's the most expensive one. He lives in London. You know, he's, he needs to choose you. You can choose him. And then I was lucky that Nick Kaysor decided that he's going to translate all my books. He loved the German girl and became my translator. And I became his nightmare. Because he called me, you know, with a different time at midnight. And he said, Armando, I don't know how to translate this phrase. He doesn't have any meaning. He said, in Spanish, it doesn't have any meaning. It's the, you know, the verse from some kind of bolero songs in Cuba that the earring that the moon lost. You know, in Spanish it doesn't have any meaning. That, you know, you have to translate it that way. And I was fighting all the time. And the version that he said is in British. It sounds like the queen is talking. And I don't need to, you know. But that's the word from my editor, you know. Peter, right now, Peter Borla, is the one to Americanize, Americanize you know, the whole translation. I think for the next book, I need to find a new translator <laughs> because it's, it's, a, it's a little, a lot of work, you know, doing with it. Yeah. Everything that I say here, is say here. <laughs> because, you know, he's not saying no, that I'm going to shake him. Do you have any other questions? Yes. Would you be so kind as to repeat the name of that book you're reading, The Seven, called? Oh, Seven Empty Houses. Yeah. Samantha, without age, Samantha. Schwebling. Yeah. You have to have it here. Yeah. What was the other word? Trust. Trust. Yeah. T R U S T. Bernan Diaz with H. Yeah. Trust is better than the, you know, trust is a masterpiece. And uh, I'm going to promote it. <laughs> it's four books in the same. You now, in the first one, you, you feel that you're reading like a beautiful novel for the 19th century about the you know, the 1930s here with this kind of beautiful language. The second one is the same character, is the biography of that character. Reading, written in a weird way. The second one is the vision of the journalist of that kind of conflict. And the fourth one is the diary of the, one of the character. When you go, to, when you start reading the four, you die. You, you know, it, it's blown your mind. It's impressive the work that he did in this story. Is the series it's the same author as a series? Is the series? No, it's no, already no, four no. books. It, it's a book with four chapters, the same that way. But it's like independent, it's a different style, different voices about the same uh, conflict. Same story. You know? And it's a love story. Mm -hmm. The, the decision to leave Cuba, was that an evolutionary process or was it a one precipitating event? There was, the, 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 when you decide to leave Cuba, is that the result of years of thinking about doing oh, yeah. yeah. Was, and was, it one, was there one event that pushed you over the line to actually make the move? Not exactly. You know, I live in a kind of way comfortable in Cuba, maybe because, you know, you know in Cuba everybody lost everything. 1959. No. My grandfather had their business. They have, you know, they were like a kind of middle class. My mother studied in American uh, school for her whole, you know, from kindergarten to 12 and became an engineer in, in Cuba. And, but living in Cuba is uh, that at the same time, you know, it's a communist country and an island is very close to poverty. And you have, you know, I always compare without, you know, I'm not comparing the Holocaust, I'm comparing a dictator, you know, that maybe in Germany, Hitler trying to find the, 
the purity of the race. In Cuba, it's the purity of your mind. You, you have to have only one way of thinking. And my family, they were Catholic, and you know, being a Catholic, you can be Yale in 1960. And they create concentration camp from religious people, for gays, or people who have a different kind of ideology. It's, it was very hard. It was not affecting my family directly because I, I grew up in a bubble in a way. And when you go to college, it's, it's your moment. You know, talking to your teachers and and seeing what happened to your friends. And I I never thought that I'm gonna take a rafter and go to Cuba. That was not in my mind ever. But at the same time, because I was in a different position, you know, I was a theater critic working in a magazine, and I was invited for Pratt Institute for a conference. And then, uh, you know, Cuba had the benefit in this country after Kennedy that if you come legally to this country a year and a day after you became a president. And I took advantage of that. I arrived in October, and in December, I was writing to the head of like a freelance. A, two years later, I became a full-time clerk reporter. Six months later, I became a reporter writing for the front page. And I worked hard. I don't think that was easy. But I remember starting working as a clerk that I have to write the obits for the paper. That was my job. But every, at 6 p.m., everybody wanted to leave the, you know, the office. And is something happening? I said, I can do it. You know, I work until 12 p.m. midnight doing interview, working during the weekend, and in six months I became a reporter number one in the newspaper. And even my salary, it was a double because I worked a lot over time. But I think, you know, my mind was, I need to leave Miami, and I love Miami right now, I have an apartment in Miami Beach, and, you know. But at that moment, if I write, for example, an interview with the actor who was nominated, you know, the movie was nominated to the Oscar, <coughs> a human actor, I was that dread I received because I was writing <coughs> about a Cuban from Cuba. And it was an assignment, you know, it, it, and the movie was nominated to the Oscar. I was covering, and, and I said, I can't, I can't. You know, I stay here for another year. And now I, there are my friends, I, my, I, I understand the whole community at the same time. But I prefer living in New York. Can you say that your parents and your family eventually came here? Or uh, your family eventually came over? Well, yeah. Uh, that's the story of all the Cubans. Oh, my mother, she was not allowed to leave the country because she was an engineering working. Everybody go for the government. Mm -hmm. When I left, she can talk to me. You know, it was illegal. Then she went to another house. <clears throat> and, you know, they were old people, and they said, "You are talking to him." Well, they listened to your conversation. And she decided to, you know, to resign and no work anymore. And then we talked freely. And my sister said to me, "I'm leaving too." And my mother said, "You are leaving." Everybody's leaving, you know, my sister, my nephew, my mother, and my mother started working as a secretary. We made me think about that. My mother, you know, she's very smart, working uh, for this company, traveling to Japan, buying, you know, she's, she's a mechanical engineer. And then she, she decided to work as a secretary in a small uh, doctor office and said, I'm going to work for you, I'm going to put this on shape, and I'm going to organize our archives, everything, but you have to give me a permit to see my sister. She didn't mention me in the United States. And she got a permit as a secretary. You know, Cuba is a disaster. They never knew that she was the other engineer working for this big company. And it was in money. My mother was 55. In, it was in 1993, 1994. And then we have to, you know, trying to get my sister and my nephew. It was seven years old. And it was another nightmare. But we get it. It's the story of the Cuban. I am not the only one. You know? <laughs> and I feel lucky, you know, to have all my family here, my cousins, my friends. 
I think my whole generation for college is Miami now. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other questions? Yes. Uh -huh. So I saw you with the Miami Book Fair when the German Girl uh -huh. came out. And I think that, at least from what I could remember, that was the first time I heard about the St. Louis. Why do you think that it's not more well known? Oh, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, uh, when I presented the idea, and thanks to In Search of Emma, my memoir, um, that someone came to my office in people in Espanol, and I thought he wants to do something related to celebrity. He said, no, no, I want you to write about your life, you know, how you created Emma. Uh, I was saying, I never write about my private life. I talk about the private life of others. <laughs> and and then I finished the book, and I was lucky because one day the Osama and Schuster, she read it in Spanish, and he said, Armando, you have to write a novel. And then I said, all the writer has a novel <laughs> with that novel. And I, 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 I remember uh, dining with her in New York, and I showed her all my research. You know, if you go to my office in New York, you're going to see, it looks like a museum of the Celtics. And she was impressed. And said, okay, let's present this story to the board in San Juan Schuster. And it took like a 15 day to have a contract. But I want this not. 15 day, I visit home the next day. And they say, you have to write an open in six months. I said, no, I need two years to read. You know, it's really slow. Right. But for my surprise, nobody knew about the St. Louis. And believe me, 90% of the editors are Jewish. They don't know about the St. Louis. And if you think about it, it was until 2008, remember, we're talking about 1939, 2008, that uh, President Obama did with the Congress a kind of apology and invited the survivor to the St. Louis. It took another eight or seven years that the Prime Minister in Canada, no not that I have them to do that kind of apology in the House of Commons. Do you know why? Because it's easier to say that Hitler killed a you know six million Jewish and, and like when you said that Cuba, you know, I say that Canada helped them to this kind of strategy to to put it on the side of your mind. It's like a protection. And that happened with the Torres Del. I, you know, doing research for the German girl, I find out about Furador Supli. And, and I, you know, when I went there, I was in shock. It was a beautiful village, okay, close to Limoges, France, that in June 1940, the Nazi arrived, put 600 women and children inside a Catholic church, and they burned them alive. And, okay, it's a tragedy. And, I, and they destroyed the whole town, you know, they burned the whole town and killed the men of the town. After the war, Charles they were rebuilt or I was like on the side and they became a, like a kind of, you know, how do you call that, like a, a museum of the tragedy. And what is the reason in France, even, you know, my books they are translating on most of the body Europe countries, the Torres del Dog, because that's a painful story. You know why? Because it, the order was for the Nazis. But the secular, they were French people. You know, all, okay, they were following orders. And with the night travel, it's the same. You know, I took it, the, the main thing is eugenic. Eugenic is a science that it was created in Pasadena in 1924, two American people. And Hitler developed all the race law based on that study from two American doctors. And here, the eugenic. It was applied in most of the states until 1970. Even you know, Virginia was the worst. You know, they sterilized people until 1970. If you have the mind problem or some kind of defects, 1970 it was yesterday. And then we prefer to put all these stories aside. It's easy to say Hitler was the only you know. And when you said Cuba, Canada, and United States send them back to the concentration camp. I just study about the Rosabo Library, you know, because uh, for all these people, Rosabo is a people, you know, it's like a, the worst. And he said in all his documents related to the St. Louis that they, you know, he didn't send them back to Germany, and that was not true. 
because they find refuge in the middle of the ocean that the Jewish organization helping them found, you know, like France, Holland, Belgium, and England to receive them. But it was in the middle of the ocean when Roosevelt said, no, they don't have any country that is going to accept it. And that's the reason I think that they don't want to do this. And even, you know, there is a lot of books about the St. Louis, that non-fiction book. Maybe here, you go to the library, you can find. But writing in a way that I wrote the book, in, in the fiction way, trying to find an emotional connection, you know, the book has been a success around the world. Even, you know, you know the story, I found survivors in many countries, and, and for my surprise, for example, the big, the big country, the country that, that has sold more books is Sweden. Yeah, they, they, they are more human than Swedish people to have an idea. It's a small, really small country. And they, they, they were you know, fascinating for this story. And, and in, in Canada, the people cry when they, they feel shame when you know, they talk about this story. That's the reason I think. Any possibility that any of your books will become movies or? Well, uh, then thanks to my dear Laura, uh, I think that we signed a contract before the pandemic with Hollywood Camp Production to develop a series. You know? And we signed the contract again because the pandemic closed everything. And supposedly by the end of 2023, we started production. And another book that I wrote, the only book that the uh, uh, publishing house bought that is finished, is this is one, it's silent in her eyes. And I did it because nobody believed in, in this book because I was changing the genre. And, you know, when you change from historical fiction to another kind of book, all the editors and agents freak out. And, and they said, okay, I want to write it in like a changing map pilot when I <laughs> finished the book. It took me like a six year, I finished it. It's called The Signing Her Eye. And it was sort of ready, and they're writing a script right now, starting in January. And that's going to be a movie. And you know, everything takes like a two, three, maybe four years. But that's excellent. Yeah, and right now, the night traveler is in the hand. You know, it was January 10th. Mm -hmm. And my agent is showing it to all these production house. Let's see what happened. Yeah. But I write books. I, I, they have a free to do whatever they want. The only thing that I always talk to the producer, I am Cuban. Please respect this story, you know, because uh, nobody's going to uh, dare to put Hitler in a good way. Fidel Castro, they can put it like a god. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say, I'm a Cuban, respect it. You know, follow the facts. If they only say that. So, uh, go ahead. I really thought that you would uh, emphasize in Cuba. But in Cuba, um, your experience is as a whole. You, you painted, in my mind, a negative, totally negative picture of Cuba. Are there anything positive going on in Cuba to kind of put balance on the world? Um, uh, do you have any like positive things to say about Cuba to kind of balance out the negative that's going on? The positive. Okay, uh, when when Fidel Castro arrived in 1959, think about it. My mother and my father, they were so happy in January, February that they created me. I was born, you know, nine months later. Everybody was celebrating the change. And I think it was a hope at the beginning, during the 60s. Because in Cuba, it was under a dictatorship too. You know, Batista, he was a president, a good president between 1940 and 1944. And if you read the night travelers, you're gonna find those years too. And then, the bad years. In 1952, it was a, you know, a coup d'etat, and they took control. They he disintegrated the Congress, and it was, you know, Cuba during the late 50s. It was like a living. The people killed themselves, and 
gangsters, it was a nightmare. Uh, and I think Castro was a hope for most of the people. But he created another kind of dictatorship. You know, uh, he closed all the newspaper, they shut down all the churches, so believe in God, it was a crime. And how can you feel like I'm finding something positive? You know, that the, he did the kind of alphabetization during the the 1960s that you know they bring kids to help to the farmers playing hard to be. I don't, I don't know. I, I, for me, it's really hard to think that way. You, I, you know how many good things I can explain about Hitler in Germany? You know, he rebuilt the mark. When Hitler took the power, a, a box of cigarettes cost 20 million marks. With Hitler, one mark. You know, and he rebuilt the country. He created a country only for Germany. And I can tell a lot of people that when I'm talking to Castro, for me it's really hard because I know it's easier to, you know, if, if you are talking about the potential reform, the, 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 the right, they're all with that. But for the left, you never, you know, you never talk to them in the same way that is someone from the right. I think so. And living in a country that you don't have a right to leave, and you need a permit to leave, and if you're, you know, I, I know people that they were married, uh, you know, in the, in the church, under, you know, without nobody knew and they went, and they get married, and when they get divorced, the, the wife showed the picture that he was married uh, with a priest, and he left, you know, he lost her, his job. Think about it. It's easier to say, okay, we have. And and the problem with the Cuba government is they reproduce the past. You know, they move the people on the power and they put themselves. They occupy the palaces. They have another skill. If you are in the government, you go to a different kind of hospital. You go to the very a primitive or middle-aged, you know, office doctors from your neighborhood and go to this kind of, that is for the people who is with dollars or for the government. It's a really complicated country. But I understand that you can find something good in Cuba. For me, I prefer to have my freedom than to have some kind of beautiful benefit that a box of cigarettes is going to cost one dollar. I think so. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, no. Well, what did you say is your favorite Cuban dish? <laughs> like, your favorite Cuban food? Oh, uh, uh, my, my, my children, you know, were born here and they love black beans. Yeah. And I think I do a great black bean with a recipe of my grandmother. And we love croquetas too. Mm -hmm. And I, but, uh, I, I belong to a generation in Cuba that the, we don't have Cuban dishes. It's from the memory of our grandparents because I grew up during the Soviet occupation of Cuba and most of the food there were from Russia, you know, Soviet Union at that moment. That kind of all with meat inside that it was vomited for us. And my grandmother washing in the cleaning hall and keeping the meat at, uh, on the side. You know, I, I grew up eating food, mm -hmm. you know, like a Cuban food, Cuban food. I remember the first time that my aunt, you know, she left in 1950, and for the first time that my grandmother saw her, it was in 1978, and said, please, let's go to eat a Cuban sandwich. It was, well, it's a Cuban sandwich, <laughs> a Cuban sandwich. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing, you know, but I love black beans, and look at that. Me too, me too. And Shisha Ronin, I don't know what you want. Oh, yeah, sure. We went to the Palacio de los Ubo, the palace was used in Miami. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have lunch here. <laughs> For a Cuban living in New York, the first thing that you do in Miami is go to the Palacio de los Ubo, the palace of Jusin. Mm -hmm. You should have been in the establishment of the embassy in Cuba. Is it? What was that? You should have been in the establishment of the Cuba. Is there a U.S. embassy in Cuba? Is there a fantasy? Oh, it's our state. 
benefit in establishing a embassy? Is there a benefit in establishing a U.S. embassy in Cuba? Is it, yes, we have a, right now. I think you know, think after Kennedy during the Bay of Pigs battle, whatever it's called, and they close. You know, they they don't have a relationship. We have in the Switzerland embassy. They have an office for the U.S. interests, and we have that kind of office in the same building that it was the U.S. Embassy, but it belonged to Switzerland, a kind of weird thing. After Obama opened the diplomatic relationship, they had a U.S. Embassy in the same building, and we found it works like an embassy. Then I don't know if you remember, I think it was before the pandemic, there was a conflict with the Sonic, and most of the employees from the embassy there was attacked with some kind of sunning and became sick from Canada and U.S. and they shut down the embassy again during Trump and think right now it's starting working slowly and, but they have an embassy. I, I used to live close to the embassy. It's a beautiful building close to the water. Did you say you live in New York for the first time? Do you have a place in New York? Yeah, she has to be in New York. Uh, I live in New York. I live in Manhattan. I know it's going to sound weird, but I, I think my, I mean, your city is the closest thing from Havana that I have. Okay. Miami is like living in the countryside in Cuba. Mm -hmm. When I arrive in Miami, I feel <laughs> like it. You know, I have to drive one hour. It's like living in a suburb. You know? mm -hmm. And Havana is a walking city with buildings, you know, hills, and the water around you. It's destroyed, but it's a beautiful city. Yes. And then New York City, when I arrived in 1997, living there, it was, you know, it was a paradise for me. I know it's a crazy <laughs> city for New York, too. But I love walking, and you know, the only exercise that I do is walking between four to 10 miles daily. When I finish to ride around 2 p.m., I walk around the city. You know, even right now with a, a Three, minus three degrees, I decided I have to stop walking when I pick up that kind of pool. But I, I love New York. I love New York. You know, people are from everywhere. You know, everybody has a different kind of accent. And mm -hmm. it, it, I feel welcome. Maybe in the end, um, because you are an animal there. But I love living there. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate I loved having this conversation. Um, thank you so much for coming. For anyone that is interested in purchasing his new book that just came out in January, we have some copies brand new right over here. If you purchase one today, then you can have him sign your book as well. Yes. But you know, Cuba is a beautiful country, and I, if you, uh, you are open to visit, the only thing that if you go, you have to have your eyes open. Even, you know, I went to China with my daughter because she was studying Mandarin. And decided to go to China. I know the reality there was playing the reality. I feel like I was living in Cuba in you know when we went to Beijing I feel the control it was a nightmare you know and but I'm fine busy. I don't want to be pessimistic you know pessimist with my country yeah. but let it feel that they're gonna be changed. Maybe my great 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 son they're gonna <laughs> <laughs> But it is you. I know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.